Oh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Patrick Brenner. I am the president of the Southwest Public Policy Institute. Thank you so much for joining us today on another episode of SPPI TV. I think we're on episode nine. This one's called They Lobby You Pay, uh, named after our uh, namesake report that just came out this week. Uh, they Lobby You Pay, Why and How to Stop Taxpayer-Funded Advocacy. I'm joined today by our vice president of research, Mr. D. Dowd. Muska. Thank you for joining me today, Dow. This is a great report. Uh, let's. Um, I'm going to get it up on the screen, and you can take it away. Oh, uh, sure, Patrick. Uh, thanks so much. It's uh, it, it's a report I'm pretty proud of, and and uh, I, if we can toot our own horn a little bit, and I think we broke some new ground, and I I dare say maybe even found some common ground where maybe people from different perspectives in our are increasingly polarized uh, country can maybe uh, come together and, uh, and, and, and try to stamp out what is a, a pernicious practice, a practice that really shouldn't go on in our country, whether it's in Washington, whether it's our state capitals or your city council, town council, your, your county commission. We're looking at lobbying in this, uh, this document. Now, uh, historians, and it's interesting, Patrick, I didn't have, a, a, when I wrote the introduction part, I, I, I didn't have a chance to really get into the, the history of it, but I, I'm kind of glad I didn't because historians are, there's a bitter disagreement about the origin of the term lobbying and where it can be traced to. Uh, and of course, in the, in the minds of Americans and the Gallup polls and other polls consistently show that lobbyists are about as popular as used car salesmen and politicians and lawyers and that sort of thing. They, they rank right down at the rock bottom in terms of trust and respect. Uh, you have nurses and doctors and scientists and small businessmen and members of the military all clustering toward the top. And lobbyists are always down at the bottom. Some of the earliest uh, examples go back to the Ulysses S. Grant transition period where he was becoming president. Uh, some historians have found examples of the term lobbying or lobbyist even before that back into the 1840s, the 1810s. There are historians that have found examples of it in the 17th century over in jolly old England. Uh, we don't really need to get into that fight. We're talking about the effect that taxpayer funded lobbyists have on you. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, taxpayer of the American Southwest, uh, the, the eight wonderful states of the American Southwest. So influencing the decision makers. I, when I was helping raise my, my young nephew many years ago, I, I had to explain what, what his uncle did for a living. And, and part of that was trying to influence the decision makers, the people who make the rules. And a good example of this uh, is from the University of Michigan when they were defining their lobbying uh, efforts uh, outside of our region, of course, but uh, they define lobbying as contacts, either in person, written, or by the phone uh, or via phone, with covered executive branch and legislative branch officials, meaning covered by lobbying disclo disclosure laws and regulations. Uh, cover uh, contacts regarding the creation of legislation, existing legislative proposals, rules, regulations, executive orders programs, policies or positions of the government, administration or execution of uh, government po programs or policies, including state, federal contracts, grants, and nomination or confirmation, this is another key part, of a person for a position subject to confirmation by a legislative uh, authority, uh, as well as the preparation time for all of these contacts via phone or written or in person or electronic. It's basically influencing the, the policy making process. And Patrick, I think uh, well, we let's, had- let's, uh, we actually, just... let's take a step back and let's make, it, because we were just talking about this before we went live. Let's make a distinction between uh, lobbying and, and electioneering. Sure, and sure. make that clear, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, my story goes back to uh, an incident where uh, Personally, I got involved in a campaign that was advocating against electioneering, and I didn't even understand the finer intricacies between electioneering versus versus lobbying in this particular context. So uh, let's let's identify that. Yeah, uh, lobbying, and of course, the word lobby meaning the 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 exterior part of a legislative body where people would hang around in, in the hallway or in the lobby, and uh, people watching us, Patrick, and you you know this as well as I do that. If you're, if you're at a hearing, if you're at a meeting, an official meeting sort of on the record subject to the public disclosure laws and you know webcasts and all that kind of stuff, usually a lot of that is, is theater. Uh, the, real, the real work's done out in the hallway, out in the lobby, uh, people kibitzing, getting together and threatening or, or promising to reward or, or you know, making deals. And I think that is kind of obvious from the word lobbying. So that's trying to influence the decision makers. Electioneering is when a, a government entity or, or a private citizen or a private organization tries to influence voters on election day to get out and vote for or against a ballot initiative or a particular politician. Uh, and so I would make a distinction between those two. And frankly, the the the, the court cases, and we'll, we'll 
get into the, the legal aspect of this, make a distinction as well. To this day, whether it's lobbying or electioneering, we don't have that decisive killer Supreme Court decision coming down and saying it is inappropriate for government to engage in either lobbying or electioneering. I'd like to think moving forward, as folks uh, in, in the limited government movement, we, we built really good public interest law firms, and we've got very at lawyers active on these issues. It seems to me this is something that's been really overlooked in terms of fighting it out uh, on the legal side. But as we'll get into later in the program, the good news is we don't have to wait for the courts. Your individual legislators, uh, your, uh, your elected officials, that even at the local level, can stop this practice themselves. So I think it's important, to, as you're right, to make that distinction between trying to influence folks on election day, how they're going to cast their actual individual votes, and trying to affect decision makers, uh, whether it's a president, whether it's a U.S. senator, whether it's your county commissioner, when they vote on ordinances and laws. Yes, absolutely. So let's um, let's actually direct people to uh, to the report itself. Um, it's it's pretty comprehensive. Uh, one of the best reports we've produced here at the Southwest Public Policy Institute so far, if I dare say. Um, you can find the report accessible online at southwestpolicy.com slash SPPI03. That's the short code. Uh, this is the third white paper that we've published under the Southwest Public Policy Institute brand. Uh, it's available on um, online in a digital format. It's also available uh, as a PDF, and there's a link to the PDF uh, in, in the, uh, on the online web page itself. Um, you can in inspect all the endnotes. There's tons of them, uh, but let's really dive into that first great, absolutely polarizing example uh, <laughs> exemplified by the Texas Association of School Boards. It is uh, it is very disturbing, uh, and it's something that that folks on the right have done great work on. And, and, I, and I will preface the rest of the program here by saying I, in no way, am disparaging the work that conservatives and libertarians have done on this issue because I think they have pointed out the fact that most, more the majority of government lobbying, whether you're talking about a, a department, a state government department, whether you're talking about uh, a mayor's office at the city level, whether you're talking about a county commission or a even a small town hiring a lobbyist, a hired gun going to a firm and hiring a lobbyist to go up to the state legislature and lobby on behalf of usually money. You know, let's face it, it's usually about money. Folks on the right have done a wonderful job over the years documenting examples of this where people who are conservatives, libertarians, maybe centrist, small government people are paying, and it's your money, it's your taxes. Most of these efforts are funded out of, and we'll get into how those, how, how that how that works, whether it's a government entity itself or whether it's a government entity uh, involved with others spending money on this. It's your money. And if you disagree with the agenda of these organizations or these entities, you are funding their speech. You are made to fund their speech. And that uh, brings up the issue of compelled speech, and we'll get into the, the, the legality of that. But in this specific example, as Patrick was saying, we're kicking we kick things off with this issue of school choice, which is, uh, Patrick, I was thinking earlier today, uh, I was going to say the school choice revolution is, is going is sweeping from coast to coast. But of course, if you look at the Pacific coast, California, Oregon, and, and Washington, uh, school choice isn't really uh, uh, very popular in, in those deep blue states. So let's say from Utah to North Carolina, the school choice revolution, I've been involved in, in this in one way or another for, for 30 years. We've never seen progress in school choice the way we have uh, in 2023. It's really something in a, in a fairly dark time in our, our nation's history. It's something to be really happy about and really excited about. And it's happening here in the Southwest as well. In Texas, uh, I guess the, the marquee bill is SB8, a, a broad uh, uh, education savings account voucher, you know, use ter whatever terminology you want, parental empowerment, school choice, education freedom, a strong bill that has uh, been drafted in the Senate, uh, unfortunately on the House of Representatives side, if you're a fan of school choice, uh, it's not going so well. Governor Abbott, uh, just a couple of days ago, uh, Texas Governor Abbott, uh, Patrick said, the Senate's version of school choice, uh, I believe that's SB8, makes about 5.5 million students eligible for uh, the uh, education savings accounts, vouchers, use your, pick your preferred term. While the House's version of that bill proposed last week would make only 4 million students eligible, the latest House version uh, crafted a couple days ago only applies to 800,000 students. So this is a controversial bill. It's being fought out even within the party, within the Republican Party of Texas, and not surprisingly, the Democratic Party, four square 
against this. Some of the leading forces uh, lobbying, uh, as we said, trying to influence this policy are taxpayer funded entities. And no one, no one uh, provides a better example of this than the Texas Association of School Boards bitterly hostile to this. Uh, they called it, and we, we cite their quote in in, in our paper, uh, TASB, T-A-S-B, called um, uh, vouchers or education savings accounts, quote, public money, into, uh, putting public money, quote, into a new costly entitlement program that would mostly benefit wealthy families in urban areas to the detriment of our public schools. And that that's pretty standard. Uh, I, I quote another really super kook leftist uh, who says that school choice is, is trying to, quote, undermine what Thomas Jefferson called the wall of separation between church and state and thereby establish conservative Christian dominance over government. Um, I'm sure a lot of you know Hindu and Jewish and agnostic and atheist supporters of school choice would uh, be interested to learn that they are trying to establish conservative Christian dominance over government. I don't know uh, where that kook gets his ideas, but let's not waste our time on that. But the core issue here is this is a a big battle over school choice in our second largest state, uh, a state that SPPI is proud to have in in, in our, our eight state region, the state of Texas, the second largest state in the union. And some of us hope one day that it becomes, um, displaces California as the largest state in the union. Still, still some ways to go on that. TASB and I, uh, Texas Association of School Boards, I could only find the most recent numbers I could find from um, IRS disclosure documents that great organization posting data in a, in a timely way came from 2018. The Texas Association of School Boards spent $841,250 on lobbying. That's that's just what we know that they were forced to disclose as all lobbyists in Texas have to comply with regulations. And, and something I didn't mention at the at the opening, Patrick, is the, is the notion that we don't really have comprehensive data on lobbying at any level uh, because not all lobbying disclosure, not all lobbying spending is disclosed. And I'm, I'm going to cite the House of Representatives. We'll, we'll just use the national example. They have a guidance for lobbying uh, co compliance at the House of Represent the U.S. House of Representatives. Just the guidance, not the laws itself, Patrick, are 59 pages long uh, and their guidance to help you comply with the law. And my favorite regulation, I just was sort of skimming through it and just completely arbitrary and just shows how a lot of these good government groups are really helpless and hopeless. Uh, again, this is from the U.S. House of Representative Guide to Lobbying Compliance. Quote, the lobbying disclosure thresholds referenced throughout this guidance have been updated to reflect changes in the consumer price index as determined by the Secretary of Labor during the preceding four-year period. As of January 1st, 2021, an organization employing in-house lobbyists is exempt from registration if its total expenses for lobbying activities, activities do not exceed and are not expected to exceed $14,000 during a quarterly period, the $3,000 income threshold for lobbying firms remains unchanged. Uh, if that makes any kind of sense to you folks, uh, you're smarter than I am. Why it's $14,000 for in-house, but lobbying firms, the disclosure is $3,000. This is played out in our 50 lab laboratories of democracy. Every state has different uh, mandated uh, reporting requirements for lobbying. So at the end of the day, we don't know uh, exactly how much money is being spent on lobbying in general, and we don't know how much of our taxpayer money is being spent on lobbying. The most recent look from uh, one of these good government groups open secrets they they have an agenda don't 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 fall for it folks but in terms of their basic research federal lobbying just federal re reached 4.1 billion dollars in 2022 the highest adjusted for inflation in a dozen years so nationally at the federal level at the state level and of course there are influences even at the at the local level of government we're talking about billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars and the Texas Association of School Boards in terms of complying with the law, and they, they're a powerful organization, they have good lawyers, I'm sure they did what they had to to comply with the law in 2018, spent $841,250. That was a larger sum, Patrick. To our friends on the left who think corporations control government, the Texas Association of School Boards spent more money on lobbying in, in 2018 than the Texas Oil and Gas Association did. Do you, do, do you think the Texas Oil and Gas Association is a is a prominent organization in the Lone Star State? I, I would think uh, most I would of us would agree that it yeah. is. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so 
the Texas Association of School Boards really spent more money than the Texas Oil and Gas Association? Uh, in terms of their disc the, the IRS documents that they had to disclose to, in order to maintain their tax against, exempt status, status under federal rules, that was the disclosure in 2018. That's the most recent I could find comparing those two organizations. Government lobbying, whether it's school boards, you know, law enforcement, prosecutors, uh, it is sub substantial it is substantial and we'll get in later there was a california study done many years ago about a decade and a half ago showing uh something like 20 23 percent of the lobbying expenses when you group it by industry were coming from government lobbying in the state of california almost a quarter from government entities Ed, Ed, patrick we are talking about big sums of money these are powerful organizations that that's huge that's huge so now that we're talking about the different uh public sector private sector lobbying let's actually talk about the distinction between uh what, what the irs refers to as direct lobbying and what they refer to as uh, grassroots lobbying uh, yeah and I, on that in the, the second second section you'll never hear me praise the irs but i do think in this case this is a pretty pretty good distinction um direct lobbying and we were we were reading from that university of michigan uh description that kind of what we think of in the old school uh the press the flesh kind of thing you know the guys with the slick suits they hang out in the hallways and the lobbies and they're always you know seen in the committee hearings or, or on the legislative bodies floors you know what amendments are being withdrawn or submitted at the markup hearing they're they're taking out language they might be adding language uh, does that benefit our industry you know can we get maybe carve out a little tax break uh, maybe we get a little subsidy there is that still in the bill what's what are the new amendments to the bill uh these people are in their money in the sense that a relatively small amount of investment in, in, in purchasing the services of a lobbyist can get you a big windfall uh, when it comes to government because government has way more money than any individual industry or any any person or any organization. And boy, can they write the laws uh, and, and, and the regulators can, can uh, uh, impact the regulations to really hurt you or help you. So direct lobbying in terms of what the IRS's description is, attempts to influence a legislative body through communication with a member or employee of a legislative body uh, or with a government official who participates in formulating legislation, uh, that kind of one-on-one -on -one, uh, hang out in the hang out in the hallway, hang out in the lobby, or maybe have a sit down, maybe take uh, uh, some important official, and I, I hesitate to use the word important. Uh, let's say uh, official who has power and authority or has access to power and authority. We won't use the, the word important. Uh, <laughs> a direct one-on-one, -on -one, taking them out to lunch, getting a drink, that kind of thing. Uh, and grassroots, Patrick, refers to a different type of lobbying where you're sort of casting your net out wider. Uh, the IRS says that it, it attempts to influence legislation by attempting to affect the opinion of the public with respect to the legislation and encouraging the audience to take action with respect to the legislation. And we have some really I'm, prime I'm USDA really cut number one examples of that here here in our study where 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 uh, you're you're trying to motivate individuals. You're not doing a kind of in this is an insider game. This is outsider game and casting that wide net. I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up. And we've got a, a prime example here. We're going to go back to the Texas Association of School Boards um, and I'm going to bring up their uh their act now page um which is uh let's uh let's get that up here on the screen real quick there we go um on the texas association of school boards twitter uh they tweeted out a uh, a request it says the house public education committee could vote on pending voucher bills at any moment contact your representative and the members of the committee and ask them to oppose vouchers. So this is what you're talking about when you reference grassroots lobbying is the encouragement of, uh, of the public to engage um, and using taxpayer dollars to facilitate that, uh, that broader outreach. Well, it's more of a roundabout uh, way than, than threatening a legislator directly and saying, you know, our, our members won't give you campaign donations or in our newsletter, we're gonna highlight the fact that you voted against us on this bill. It's trying to get uh, vo voters or at least citizens, potential voters, uh, to apply their pressure. And if you really talk to people in the industry, Patrick, it's there's a lot more people in the general public than work in your particular industry or belong to your particular organization. So uh, grassroots lobbying time and time again can be more effective than that kind of sleazy thing we think of, of uh, you know, greasing the old palm and and sitting down and going to the, or going out to the expensive restaurant or, or promising a politician uh, a job for their relative or that kind of thing, which all those things actually do happen, folks. I've been doing this a long time. The grassroots is in a way, is a way to get 
uh, to sort of swarm uh, the, the the switchboard or to clog a you know a politician's uh, Twitter account or something like that to get people really motivated and show that the voters. So when it comes time for a re-election, you could pay a price for going against uh, our our position on this law, this bill, this regulation. So I want to again make a distinction here. This report specifically touches on just taxpayer funded lobbying. Yes. This is not uh, should the um, should a 501c4 that is allowed to engage in certain uh, grassroots lobbying efforts, should a C4 organization that is a, a private sector organization decide to engage on a particular effort for or against a particular piece of legislation, uh, that is not something that we're we're going after here. We're specifically going after a taxpayer funded organization or a, a ta the government lobbying, right? A absolutely. And this will probably uh, get me fired from the internet for the rest of my life. But as I was saying earlier, the, the, the polling on lobbyists, I mean, lobbyists are some of the most hated groups of people in, in, in the country. The First Amendment to the United States Constitution, our founding document of our, of our great nation, enshrines in, 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 in our civil religion, as many people call it, the idea that the right to petition government for redress of grievances is, uh, again, it's in item number one in our Bill of Rights. The issue isn't lobbying. Uh, if you want to hire yourself out of this lobbying, if you want to act as a private lobby lobbyist and contact legislators and county commissioners and mayors all you want, uh, go right ahead. I don't think particularly that lobbying is a is a bad thing. A lot of our friends on the left, the, the so-called good government groups who never mention government lobbying, that you'll never see them expose this because they're not really about good government. They're about pushing their agenda. Uh, we, we could do that. We could do that show. Uh, later on, Patrick, we could do a whole hour on that. N no problem. This sort of common cause uh, organizations, which I think are, are pretty dishonest. Um, lobbying to me is not a dirty word. Government, particularly the kind of government we have in America now, where it's, it affects us in every way. I mean, the federal government regulates how much water is in your toilet. I mean, it is insane that the people who founded this country would have no, could not relate to this, whether you think it's a good thing or a bad thing. They could not relate to the idea of the, the, the pervasiveness of government in our lives. And it's only natural that interests, and I won't use the weasel term special interests, we're all in interests. Uh, I would like to have lower taxes. That would benefit my life uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, Patrick has three children. Uh, he's particularly attuned to uh, child issues as, as he's raising those young ones. Uh, he'd be particularly uh, careful about those issues in terms of how government uh, affects parental rights, affects education, that sort of thing. So the idea that you are active in trying to pressure decision makers uh, that you are, maybe all of us to some extent, are lobbyists. Uh, to me, Patrick, that is not a dirty word. The point of our paper, uh, and you, you get it right in the, in, the, in, the, in the headline, is government funded, and by that we mean taxpayer funded lobbying. Basically, uh, and someone used this term, I think it's a pretty good one, intergovernmental advocacy. This is one level of government uh, acting to influence another level of government, and they're doing it on your dime. That is the focus here, uh, and it is not, to me, Patrick, it's not a right or left wing issue at all. It's a fundamental civil liberties issue, and I think that right and left could come together on this in, in unison to decide that this is not something we want. And, and in the paper, we walk you through the, the three primary mechanisms by which uh, government engages in lobbying, and the first one's just sort of obvious. Governments have become even little tiny towns, small counties, uh, relatively small departments of state government have become very adept with public information officers, with press releases, with social media. So that's kind of the in-house stuff. Uh, they will use their communication platforms to lobby on legislation and many times mentioning not just we need a bigger budget or we need to help children or we need to uh, we need to fight school choice or support school choice. But they will mention the names of bills get very, very specific. And we, we have an example of that uh, later in the bill. And of course, these officials also go up and they testify during hearings. They they, they testify at public meetings of, of city councils and county commissions. There are press conferences. They will put on briefings. They will meet one on one. Uh, you see this quite a lot when, when state governments have their legislative sessions. You will see government officials up there meeting uh, with, with state legislators to, let's face it, influence those legislators. And again, uh, the explosion of cheap digital media press releases, uh, statements, op-eds. We have an example of that uh, later uh, Later today. We can discuss that. Uh, social media posts. And 
they also employ, depending on how big they are, usually you need to have a budget for this uh, if you have a big staff, what are called uh, uh, workers in intergovernmental relations. Sometimes they're called legislative affairs. So that's the in-house stuff that is done uh, by governments. And you're paying for all of that, folks. Uh, you, you might not be paying for 100% of some of these other uh, mechanisms we'll discuss, but when it's in-house as a taxpayer, you are paying for all of that. Second uh, type of, of, of tool that governments use to lobby, believe it or not, they will hire lobbyists. Uh, we have an example of a little town, a fairly smallish sized municipality in Texas, uh, paying uh, thousands and thousands of dollars to hire a contract lobbyist to go up to Austin, to the state capitol, and it, it could be anywhere, Santa Fe or Sacramento, and represent your entity, whatever it is, a small town, a county, what a big city. And so these people are, are paid pretty well. And sometimes these contracts can be, even for a relatively short legislative session, uh, these uh, professionals can do very, very well. And they really excel at finding special appropriations. It could be sort of a bond money. It could be a special appropriate, an emergency appropriation if your county had flood damage or fire damage or something like that. Uh, you get a lot of bang for your buck when it comes to hiring a professional lobbyist, particularly someone who's been up at the state capitol for a long time. And a lot of the most powerful lobbyists are people who've been doing this for 20, 30, 40 years. They've built those relationships. And we are social beings we are we are social creatures and uh some of the most powerful lobbying is from the people who have been up there doing it the longest and know where the where the skeletons are in the closet and then where the, the bodies are buried and patrick our third our third tool that governments use to lobby and this gets a little technical and I'll, I'll try to just keep it not so boring is organizations organizations un organized as nonprofit entities they are taxpayer exempt they don't pay taxes to the to the federal government at the irs and it gets a little technical but i will just very quickly talk about uh three types uh, 501c3 c4 and c6 um charitable organizations are usually called are, are that, that's the term for 501c3s they can influence legislation but not as a substantial part of their activities and we can get into that i do think there are some examples of organizations government uh c3 entities which are probably violating uh, the irs regulations and uh, i think we need some attention from legislators on that a c4 entity uh is more of an activist organization uh it uh, it's again another nonprofit charitable organization they let they may engage in pursuing legislation what the irs calls germane to the organization's programs and then c6 which is more common than i than I would have originally thought. Usually this is sort of the chamber of commerce, uh, 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 real estate boards, boards of trade. Again, another nonprofit entity organized under the, the IRS regulations, and they can do lobbying uh, related to what their expressed uh, purpose uh, of the, the C4, C6 organization is. So three ways, they're spending money in-house, they're hiring out, they're contracting out hired guns, and they pay membership dues and by membership dues i mean your tax dollars to what amount to basically trade associations for government so this could be associations of police officers sheriff's associations school boards we just discussed what's going on in, in texas and these entities these 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 nonprofit entities c3 c4 c6 boy they can derive major portions of their funding. Sometimes they get outside sources, but they can derive major portions of their funding from dues. And of course, those dues are parts of the budgets of governmental entities. And where do governmental entities get their money, folks? They get it from you. Yes. Yes. I mean, that's that is such a critical part of of all of this is that you have to understand that, that the where the money is coming from, the money is coming from the taxpayers. It is going to the government. The government is giving it to an entity and that entity is then lobbying in some cases against taxpayer interests. Exactly. Exactly. And uh, we'll, we'll get in. We'll get into a, a, an interesting example later, Patrick. But, you know, people have wildly different perspectives in this country. We you know, we have people who are into Wicca. Uh, we have people who who uh, have. Uh, I'm a libertarian. I, I don't. I don't believe that most of what government does it should be doing. It is wrong. Even if even if a government entity is lobbying for something that has a 70% approval rating, it is wrong to to spend public money to force someone to pay for the propagation of ideas of policy advocacy of of, of influence peddling for an idea that they don't agree with. And in our widely divergent, diverse country. You're always going to find someone, you're always going to find a taxpayer in that city, in that county, in that state who doesn't agree with that taxpayer lobbying, no matter how popular it may be in a poll. It's fundamentally wrong, and it's opposed to our, our and we'll get into the, the court cases, where government 
and, and courts have been very good over the, the centuries, protecting people's rights to not have their speech restricted. But the, the, the flip side of that coin is to not compel speech. That's a, a broader issue uh, uh, called compel speech. And there's been many, many cases, and we'll, we'll, we'll get into that later on. Um, but but, but if, this, this brings up something really important that I want to touch on, is that this, this, ta this concept of taxpayer-funded lobbying is something that transcends politics. This is something that occurs on both sides. And we identify examples from both sides of the political spectrum here uh, where uh, egregious use of taxpayer dollars for this taxpayer funded lobbying. Yeah. And I think that's where we broke new ground uh, with this paper. And I don't mean to, and again, I, 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 we stand on the shoulders of giants. Um, they're great. The, the Goldwater Institute in Arizona, uh, the Texas Public Policy Foundation, the Pacific Research uh, Shop out in, out in California. They have done wonderful job on this, jobs on this. And uh, individual taxpayers. Uh, I, I, I don't know if Americans for Prosperity is Americans for Prosperity anymore, but they've, they've been engaged on this fight. But until now, until this very week, I would say, until, we, until our, our report uh, went, went live earlier this week, this issue has been perceived as on the right. And, and we're going to walk you through the, the examples because we, we cover the eight states of the Southwest. I picked uh, two of my favorite examples from uh, all of our eight states. And if we have time, we'll get through all 16 examples of government entities, your tax dollars, uh, lobbying for uh, legislation or, or issues or trying to fortify or reinforce a narrative uh, at, at a capital complex in which you may disagree. But as I was going through all this, and I've been working on this for, for, for months, the time and again, I would encounter government spending resources advancing positions that would make our friend, friends on the progressive left quite upset. Uh, and we'll, we'll get to those examples in a second. We're going to walk you through our, our examples for each state. And, and this was not hard. Uh, to, to find these examples, it is not hard, particularly at a time uh, when most uh, states are still, most legislative sessions are, are still underway. Uh, government lobbying is at its uh, highest, of course, when uh, all that money is being appropriated by by state capitals. Let me start you yeah, in our, our, our wonderful Arizona, uh, great Great state, maybe future home of, of one D. Dowd Muska, we don't know. Uh, the League of Arizona Cities and Towns. Um, again, a, a curious title because surely there are people in Arizona, not just residents, but elected officials in Arizona uh, cities and towns who might not agree with the lobbying agenda of the League of Arizona Cities and Towns, but where people are, are in Arizona are, are paying for that. Um, they did a very slick, and, and Patrick did a, a dive on this online uh, and, and found a wonderful uh, example of what their agenda is the 2023 municipal policy statement. Uh, they want to retain certain taxes, of course. They want a state-level emergency rental assistance program. Uh, many, many bullet points, and, and Patrick put that uh, in the study, so you can see for yourself what the agenda of the League of Arizona Cities and Towns uh, is in 2023. Well, if you're an Arizonan, maybe you uh, don't want to preserve those taxes. Maybe you don't think there should be a state-level emergency rental assistance program. Well, too bad for you. Tough luck, sucker. You're, you're paying for that advocacy. Again, that's compelled speech and we'll we'll get into the, the definition of compelled speech uh, uh later on okay arizona the arizona department of environmental quality they tweeted out that their legislative team she joined their this new uh, hire for this new position joined their legislative team in in 2020 and she's going to uh, work in her new role related to uh, our critical work she is the legislative liaison uh for the arizona department of environmental quality well that bureaucracy has its own agenda. Uh, I think probably some folks who maybe aren't all in on the the way that uh, environmentalism is, is pushed today. I would certainly include my, myself in the list. Uh, maybe they're not comfortable having a legislative liaison, a full-time, probably fairly well compensated person who is a one-stop shopping for legislators to uh, understand the position of this bureaucracy. Uh, you may disagree with it, but you're paying for uh, Ms. Osterberg. No, no personal attack on her, but uh, if she wants to advocate for environmental policies, maybe she should work for an organization that gets voluntary uh, contributions. Okay, what I was mentioning earlier about uh, contract lobbying, the city of Weslaco. It's a small municipality in Hidalgo County in our, our beloved Lone Star State. Uh, just before the start of the session, which is about to wrap up, I guess we're probably looking at what, less than less than two weeks. Uh, they will be paying a, their hired gun $7,500 a month uh, plus up to $1,000 in pre-approved expenses uh, for the next two years to act as the county's lobbyist. Um, something tells me he'll be pushing ideas and concepts and appropriations and legislation that maybe the people in that municipality, at least one person in that municipality, does not support. Tough, you're paying for it. 
This next uh, example, Patrick, was really interesting, and I, 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 I'm I, very proud of myself for finding this one because it's an example of when government entities contribute to a lobbying organization uh, that is not really identified as a government lobbying entity. It's an organization called Texans for the Arts, uh, and their legislative agenda in 2023, uh, not surprisingly, is threefold, to protect and grow the appropriations, meaning your money, folks, to the Texas Commission on the Arts, uh, including the Cultural District Grant Program, more money, uh, to protect the statutory protections for the arts of the municipal hotel occupancy tax. Well, maybe some people don't think that tax should exist. I'm personally a big opponent of lodging taxes. I think they're insane. Uh, and to respond to additional legislative opportunities. Uh, that's a wonderful, wonderful phrase uh, that advance and strengthen the arts, culture and creative industry across the state. Um, I'm a firm supporter of the arts. What would life be like? without the arts. Uh, why is the city of San Antonio using taxpayer money to support this organization? Why is the city of Dallas using taxpayer organization, uh, taxpayer resources uh, devoted to this organization? Why is the city of Austin, the economic development department, which I think probably gets some tax dollars, why are they backing Texans for the arts and their very blatant agenda to uh, retain taxes and to raise uh, the appropriation level for the arts in Texas. Uh, again, we're not against the arts. We're against taxpayer funding being used to lobby for greater government appropriations for the arts. Let, never never, uh, never make that mistake. Uh, we're, we're probably generally in for a lot of the concepts discussed in this paper. It's the role of taxpayers being compelled to support these lobbying efforts that we are objecting to and, and we think everyone should object to. Uh, found a good example of the National, uh, the Nevada Association of School Administrators uh, up in Carson City, my, my beloved Carson City. I used to sit at the McDonald's years ago in Carson City and look at those beautiful mountains. Uh, at the start of the legislative session earlier this year, the newly sworn in uh, Republican governor who ousted the incumbent, which didn't happen much in 2022. Uh, most governors got, got reelected, but uh, Governor Lombardo gave his state of the state address. And there was a picture on the Twitter account of the Nevada Association of School Administrators. Uh, he was very delighted to be uh, up in Carson City, pressing the flesh and talking to so many friends and supporters of educators. Uh, and when uh, a representative from an association of school administrators says he's uh, shaking hands with supporters and friends of educators, that means he's fighting school choice. I think you can probably take take that one to the bank. Uh, at the start of this year, 2023, uh, Lyon County, we're not talking about a municipality here, we're talking about a county, uh, Lyon County up in uh, Northwest Nevada, uh, prepared for the 2023 legislative session with its lobbyist, Steve and Mary Walker of Walker and associates, uh, they were getting ready to track important bills and provide direction for the county, the county's legislative agenda. You see this many, many times uh, at, the, at the municipal and the county level, they will release their legislative agenda, whether their constituents uh, support that legislative agenda or not. Okay, moving on to Utah, the state, uh, our favorite state in the American Southwest, a uh, state that was, I believe, recently named, Patrick, I don't know if you saw it, the best state in America. Uh, they were looking at the economic prospects um, of the state and crime and recreational opportunities uh, when, when they did many, many, I think it might have been U.S. US News and World Report, uh, Utah came out as the best state. Well, in they have one of the one of the greatest think tanks in the American Southwest, too. I mean, the Libertas Institute and all the work that they do on uh, with the Tuttle Twins. I mean, that's that's great. Just, and that's, just, that's homegrown right there in Utah. Just terrific. Utah gets so many things right. And uh, one thing they don't get right, <laughs> unfortunately, is they permit uh, they don't have to uh, the governmental entities there. They don't they can stop this, but they permit taxpayer funded lobbying. So we're talking about February 2023. The, the legislative session in Utah is now over. They have a fairly short one. Uh, the Utah Arts and Museums, that's a department of government, and the Utah Film Commission, uh, they promoted and participated in, and, and we haven't talked about this yet, Patrick, but oftentimes at the state capitals during legislative sessions, you will have a particular industry or uh, a particular business or uh, social service will have a day in which it's our day, uh, Cultural Industry Advocacy Day. Uh, here in New Mexico, we have uh, Film and Television Day uh, where private interests try to educate legislators about how wonderful that particular uh, uh, service or good or industry is and why legislators should look favorably upon that. Uh, the events ed attendees, this is the Utah Film Commission's Twitter account, uh, you were encouraged to quote, speak to legislators and build support for our bills and appropriations that positively impact our industry. Our, close quote, our bills, our bills. That's very interesting. These are 
state departments, uh, uh, bureaucracies in Utah, the Utah, Utah Arts and Museums and the Utah Film Commission saying our bills. We want you to get out there and support our bills. Uh, well, that's I, like I, Randy Weingarten on Twitter calling our children when she has no children of her own. It's, it's, it's interesting, yeah. isn't it? I mean, I, I, I thought legislators well, had bills. You have, you know, legislators sponsor down? bills. Yeah. Hey. Well, who, who would be let's, against? Let's, hang on. Let's take a step back. Let's take a step back. What is the definition of socialism? Is it not government ownership of the means of production? Uh, that is the right? traditional. Like, when they say yeah. our, yes, I mean, that's what they're doing. Yes, yes, yes. Interesting. In a, in in what 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 a state is perceived to be very very red. Uh, that's our friends in in, in Utah. Um, doubling down on this, the University of Utah, when, this, when the session was over, again, we had a fairly session short, they were one of the first states to get out of session this year. Uh, the University of Utah, they, they issued a, I think it was a press release, boasting about how they had, quote, a very successful year, the most the university has ever received in direct appropriations, uh, close quote. So um, I guess we should take that to mean, I think it's a reasonable conclusion that they were up uh, lobbying the, the capital complex for more money. Uh, they received more than $250 million in direct funding for buildings, uh, authority to bond for up to $600 million to build campus housing, uh, up to 5.5% raises for university employees. So uh, the university was up there with their uh, with their employees and, and using their resources lobbying for more money, and they were doing it on the dime of the good people of the beehive state. In January, uh, commissioners in Eagle County, Colorado, our, our, our beloved uh, our beloved Colorado, just north from of where Patrick and I are in, in New Mexico, uh, they approved, and I was talking about this earlier, a resolution for the county's legislative policy statement. Uh, its priorities included fund funding, additional funding for housing, more funding for housing, uh, as well as they wanted more subsidies from the American Rescue Plan Act. I think we've got, uh, I believe that must be, um, uh, pandemic relief funding, I, I can only assume, uh, for, for behavioral health. Uh, the county also endorsed the policy statement from the Colorado Communities for Climate Action. Uh, something tells me there's someone in Eagle County, Colorado, who is not on board with Colorado Communities for Climate Action, but he or she uh, paid to endorse those views. Uh, our second example in Colorado was the Department of Agriculture, uh, a government entity, a state level entity, doing sort of an after the fact lobbying. They were celebrating four legislators, uh, not not two Republicans, two Democrats, three Democrats, one Republican, uh, for uh, agreeing to uh, the uh, right to repair legislation for farmers and ranchers. Uh, again, you can support or oppose this. I'm very skeptical when it comes to that whole right to repair concept and the Competitive Enterprise Institute has done good work on that. But regardless of where you stand on the issue, uh, should government entities be lobbying on that? All right, now moving on to the big dog, uh, California. A couple months ago, the California Transit Association, again, funded with membership dues from California transit agencies, government entities, uh, in an online publication, uh, worried uh, and uh, scaremongered over that uh, the issue of uh, dedicated operations funding was needed. Uh, if not, some of the state's largest transit agencies will have to reduce service, lay off staff, and defer maintenance and modernization programs. I guess that prompts the question, uh, if that happened, would anyone notice, given the fact that transit is absolutely dying in this country, uh, all over this country? Um, I'm going to stop there, Patrick, because I think we probably made a pretty good uh, case for what we're talking about. Uh, we also have cases, uh, two examples from Oklahoma. We have uh, an additional example from Colorado. We have two more examples from um, New Mexico. This is pervasive, pervasive, pervasive. Government using its resources, paying lobbyists, uh, passing uh, legislative agenda, legislative priorities, uh, and belonging to membership organizations that are very active in trying to influence government decision makers. It is wrong, wrong, wrong. What you might have noticed is most of those examples that we use would probably be offended, offensive to center leaning right, uh, conservative, libertarian, free market, limited government, pro-taxpayer organizations. And until we released our paper this week, that's really been, if not the core argument, then one of the central arguments of people who oppose taxpayer-funded lobbying, that uh, it lobbies, it's government lobbying for more government. And that we in no way dispute that. We document examples of that just from the last few months in our region of the country. But it's a mistake to think that governmental entities lobbying are always opposed to the right. Uh, we document a number of examples here, Patrick, and my favorite is is, is a is a viciously, bitterly fought bill uh, to our north, right up here in, in Colorado, a state that's experiencing what a lot of places are experiencing an affordable housing problem. The liberal Democratic governor of, of, of Colorado, um, 
Jared Polis, uh, there was a bill, Senate Bill 23 uh, 213. It was what opponents considered a, a, a reprehensible sort of uh, usurpation of local uh, control of land use decision making. It was designed uh, by a lot of people. I think the, the the Black Chamber of Commerce, a lot of of Colorado, a lot of environmental organizations, not all of them, but some uh, were four square behind this. Governments, particularly county governments, uh, municipal governments came out strongly against this. Again, a bill backed by liberal progressives, backed by the liberal progressive governor in California, designed, not necessarily, it wouldn't necessarily have the effect of improving affordable housing. We'd have to see down the road if that actually would happen or not. Um, but it was designed uh, and by liberals, backed by liberal progressives. Government entities, powerful government entities, and the one I'm thinking about is the Colorado Municipal League. That is a very, very powerful uh, lobbying force in Colorado, whether you're looking at government or, or all lobbying entities, came out in force, denounced it almost from the point it was uh, announced. Mayors in 39 cities and towns, just in the Denver metro region alone, came out against this legislation. Uh, Pitkin County, home to Aspen, so there's some folks with some considerable money in, in Pitkin County, uh, and the very affluent uh, jurisdictions in, in, in Colorado came out four square against this. A lot of liberal wealthy folks in Colorado, but they didn't want this bill. Uh, one might even say these folks were against affordable housing. Uh, that's not how they couched it. Uh, they, they just didn't want uh, land use control removed from the local level. But again, you had primarily liberal organizations, liberal voices, liberal politicians voting for this bill. And, and for the record, if you want to know the power of uh, of a municipal county government in Colorado, that bill didn't survive uh, the legislative uh, this particular session. So they're going to have to, uh, they're going to have the progressives are going to have to come back on that. Didn't didn't happen. Um, Lone Tree, a small city in Douglas County, quote, this is their statement. The, the bill silences the voices of our residents and disregards prior decisions made by voters by taking away the right to be heard at public hearings on zoning matters or to use their constitutional rights of initiative or referendum to address zoning and land use matters. So, Patrick, this was an example of government lobbying, taxpayer funded lobbying against the progressive left. And we have a number of other examples of uh, and, and, probably most prominently other than this bill, where you had the superintendent of education in Arizona using the Twitter account of the Arizona Department of Education, which Arizonans pay for, to lobby for school choice at a time when school board organization, teacher organizations, other government schooling organizations, taxpayer funded, are lobbying against school choice in Arizona. So in Arizona, you have, you have this wonderful example uh, okay. of you are paying to fight and defend school choice in the Grand Canyon State. I mean, this is the bizarro world we have entered. What what, what a feeding frenzy. I'm, on, on the one hand, I, I'm we, we are wholly supportive of the concept of universal school choice. But the problem here is you have taxpayer dollars being used to advocate for a program that you may or may not agree with. That's the core argument, Patrick. And, and again, I'll, I'll toot our horn a little bit on this. People on the right our, it, it makes our blood boil. It makes Patrick's blood boil and my blood boil. We've we fought many, many times when we are trying well, to educate. Hang, hang on. It's it not, not my blood boil. It makes me want to pull my hair out. <laughs> <laughs> An unproductive activity for Mr. Brenner, ladies and gentlemen. But um, when we are communicating to the public, when we're debating an issue, when we're writing op-eds and, and people are, are fighting our ideas, we are often fighting people who are taxpayer funded. These are government entities or government organizations, governments themselves, elected officials, uh, these membership organizations, and it makes our blood boil. And so this has come, and I think wrongly, this issue of taxpayer funded lobbying has come to be identified with the right. I think we make a very compelling argument in, in here, uh, whether it's on the issue of school choice, whether it's on the issue of, of criminal justice reform, the Nevada Sheriffs and Chiefs Association. So you've got the Chiefs of Police and the Nevada Sheriffs in in, in the Silver State coming out saying that, you know, the, the defund the police movement is awful. We want uh, members of Congress and members of state legislatures to step up uh, and stop fanning the flames of emotion by supporting the defund the police movement. Uh, they were very, very vocal on this. So basically they were coming out against a very progressive, uh, you know, defund the, move, defund the police, Black Lives Matter movement. This is the Nevada Sheriffs and Chiefs Association fighting the progressive left, and we have other examples of this in our in our in our paper here. So, my argument, Patrick, to our, our friends on the left, and and you know, I think it's important when we can find common ground in in a very angry country to find that common ground is 
the people in the past, you know, even if it was true in the past, it's certainly no longer the case now. Government funded entities are using their platforms to lobby against ideas, concepts, regulations, ordinances, and bills that you're for and to lobby for these uh, measures that you're against. Don't identify this just on the right. And what this gets to on a, on a very fundamental level is the issue of, of compelled speech. I know we're running really late. Uh, we're running out of time, Patrick, but uh, I wanted to get to this issue of compelled speech. It's one thing for the government to restrict your ability to say something. Um, uh, and we, we see examples of this when uh, local governments try to regulate when you put political signs on your uh, on your yard. Uh, these, these things are fought over uh, every election year. But there's another element of this, which is forcing someone to say things they don't want to say either directly uh, or indirectly. And I found in, in, in my research, Patrick, I found in the first case of a state Supreme Court coming out against compelled speech goes all the way back to 1894. The Georgia Supreme Court overturned a statute in Georgia that compelled employers to write a letter to each employee they fired explaining the reasons for that employee's termination because the, the, the justices said that amounts to forcing a company to create a, a type of communication that, that, that is just fundamentally uh, against the concept of I don't have to say what I don't want to say, uh, and you can't restrict my right uh, to say what I do want to say. That that goes all the way back uh, again, 100 and, you know, 130 years. The probably the most prominent argument, uh, prominent example of this uh, in our nation's history came in 1950, uh, 1943. This was a case out of West Virginia where the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that Jehovah's Witnesses could not, their children could not be compelled to say the Pledge of Allegiance in schools because that amounted to compelled speech and bring it up kind of more to the to the current era it's it's rather interesting the janus decision now this was a decision that came out regarding public employee uh, unions whether they had the right to compel members uh, of the well not members but people who did not want that represent, representation whether under state law you could be compelled to pay what was called an agency fee because they were representing you whether you liked it or not the supreme court decided and uh, samuel alito our, our justice wrote what i think was a, a very good decision that basically anything a government union does is has an implication for policy or, or politics. And uh, Samuel Alito wrote, quote, the free speech rights of non-members, these are people who didn't want to be part of the government union, um, were violated because the union compelled them to subsidize private speech on matters of substantial public concern. Really interesting quote. Well, if you're being forced as a taxpayer to support lobbying efforts, uh, your free speech rights as a taxpayer uh, you are being, quote, to use the Justice Alito's uh, argument, uh, you are being compelled to, quote, subsidize private speech on matters of substantial public concern, aren't you? Uh, these are government, either governments themselves or peeping, people acting on the behalf of governments as a hired gun lobbyist or as an organization going out there and being very specific at times in terms of opposing or supporting measures, legislation, ordinances, that kind of thing. What's really the difference between what the Supreme Court ruled in, in 2018 in the Janus case and taxpayer funded lobbying? I think uh, there, there might be an opportunity if we could have some of our public interest law firms on the right and on the left come together and attack this on, uh, on, the, on the argument that you are compelling the speech when, when, when taxpayers are forced to support these organizations in, in whatever form they take, whether it's a membership organization or whether it's a, a lobbying firm being hired to go out and represent a government entity. I know that some defenders, Patrick, would say, well, these are this is a, a legitimate government purpose because they're promoting the general welfare. Well, I'm not so sure that you're promoting the general welfare if you're backing legislation, which clearly has an opposition to it. Clearly, uh, you know, there are private organizations or there are people going up to testify against a particular bill. Can you say that government's just promoting the general welfare and there's a legitimate public purpose for government to be a lobbyist when obviously people are disagreeing on a lot of these issues? Um, I would like to see whether it's the ACLU, whether it's the Institute for Justice on the libertarian right or the ACLU on the far left, uh, can we come together and all decide this is a is a, a breach. It's a, a fundamental violation of our rights under the First Amendment. I shouldn't have to pay for the Department of Environmental Quality or my county or my or my city or the film commission 
to try to influence public policy that I Dowd, I You brought up some really great questions and you've brought up a great uh, mechanism by which the left and the right can come together and, and agree on something. And, and that was one of the founding principles of the Southwest Public Policy Institute is we wanted to move forward our motto of, of we agree better living through better policy through uh, areas where, where we can agree. And I, I think this is one incredible example. It's a beautiful document that you've created. I mean, this is a wonderful report that really transcends political partisanship. It, it really does. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, yeah, you're and watching I, uh, SPPI TV episode nine, They Lobby You Pay. Uh, I wanted to take two seconds real quick and uh, ask you to consider making a tax deductible gifts to the Southwest Public Policy Institute. You can give online today at southwestpolicy.com slash donate, or you can uh, take a picture of the QR code and it'll take you straight there. You can give as little as $9 a month to help us do our work. The Southwest Public Policy Institute is a 501c3. We talked about that earlier in our uh, our episode. Uh, we're Not taxpayer funded, right, by the right, way, right. folks. All taxpayer funded, <laughs> um, in a way. <laughs> <laughs> voluntary. We, it's a voluntarily taxpayer funded. Um, the Southwest Public Policy Institute is a 501c3 nonprofit charitable organization. Uh, donations to the Institute are tax deductible. You'll get a receipt in the mail. Um, Dowd, uh, I'm going to hand it back to you. Uh, take it away and uh, let's, uh, let's get the, this uh, episode nine wrapped up before we move into double digit episodes. <laughs> oh, I could do another hour well, on this. I, I know, pattern. I know. Just, just, let's give our people you a go break. take care of the kids. I'll, <laughs> I'll stick around for another hour. Um, yeah, we, we only have about two, three minutes left, folks. Um, there are mechanisms, and, and actually Texas has a good law that applies to state government, but unfortunately it doesn't cover local government. Uh, there's also some good laws in, in Louisiana, of all places, and Washington State has a great law. Plus, the American Legislative Exchange Council has drafted an ordinance that you could take to your local, just your little bitty village, uh, town, city council, your county commission, that can be adopted by commissioners, uh, counselors, aldermen, wherever you are in America, uh, just basically ending that practice uh, in your local community. So we can stop this. We don't have to wait for the nuclear bomb decision from the Supreme Court 15 years from now, although it would be nice to eventually have one of those. Um, so the, the solutions are discussed at the end. We're a solution-oriented think tank. So we don't just complain. We've got the solutions. But I wanted to wrap up, Patrick, with just re reiterating that the, the, the way that the way that this uh, this charts new ground. And I, I've been doing public policy research for 30 years. I, I don't expect that later on today, uh, Patrick, we're going to be deluged with tens of thousands of leftists saying we're, we're, we want to help SPPI uh, eliminate taxpayer funded lobbying. I'm, I'm just, I've, I have too many scars from, from, uh, from, from three decades of doing this. But my plea at the end is our friends in the center and on the left. This is a fundamental violation whatever your ideological predilection, uh, whatever your ideological uh, persuasion might be. And I think we've cited specific examples right here, just from our region in the Southwest, and I'm sure you could find examples from other parts of the country as well, of government money, lobbying, framing a narrative, fortifying a narrative, opposing or supporting uh, city government ordinances, county commission ordinances, legislation, right up in Washington or right in your state capital that people on the progressive left are not happy with, all right? And this messaging that is being sent out and it is being done by conservative people in government, those resources in government should not be used. Conservative, libertarian, centrist, uh, corporatist, uh, vegetarian, uh, what did John McCain used to say? Libertarian, vegetarian, uh, or, or big government, uh, uh, you know, far left. These resources, your public resources, your tax dollars should not be spent on speech and lobbying is speech, it's communication. Um, that, that's just what it is, uh, should not be spent regardless of what your position is. It's particularly offensive when you're opposed to it, but as a general principle, we should not be doing this in a country that enshrined first free speech and the first amendment, the, the number, the first item in the bill of rights of our constitution. Uh, we need to stop this ladies and gentlemen, and we have mechanisms to stop this. We can stop this. And uh, we hope uh, you hope you, we hope you'll read our report uh, and uh, get caught, get up, caught, caught up to speed on this and begin talking to other activists, to other elected officials, maybe even reach out to some people, you know, on the left and say, can we unite uh, behind opposition to this concept that is really fundamentally opposed to free speech, to the Bill of Rights. Uh, we hope we've made a, a, an important contribution to this debate, all of our supporters. And if you like the policy analysis, 
uh, cut us uh, just a few bucks our way because uh, we're, uh, we're we turned one year old just uh, this month itself. We're, we're a very new organization and we are fighting to uh, preserve good policy in the Southwest and maintain our region as a beacon of good policy in the American Southwest. So thank you for joining us today. Uh, we will be back. Uh, we will be back next Friday with more, uh, uh, more, more, more fun, more policy fun. Thanks so much. Uh, check us out, southwestpolicy.com. Give the study a read. Uh, I think uh, I think it'll be worth well worth your time. Thank you. <laughs>